Chapter 14 The Beginning of the End of the World Slowly the door opened again, and out there came a figure as tall and straight as the girl's, but not so slender. It carried no light, but light seemed to come from it. As it came nearer, Lucy saw that it was like an old man. His silver beard came down to his bare feet in front, and his silver hair hung down to his heels behind, and his robe appeared to be made from the fleece of silver sheep. He looked so mild and grave that once more all the travellers rose to their feet and stood in silence. But the old man came on, without speaking to the travellers, and stood on the other side of the table, opposite to his daughter. Then both of them held up their arms before them, and turned to face the east. In that position they began to sing. I wish I could write down the song, but no one who was present could remember it. Lucy said afterward that it was high, almost shrill, but very beautiful. A cold kind of song, an early morning kind of song. And as they sang, the grey clouds lifted from the eastern sky, and the white patches grew bigger and bigger, till it was all white, and the sea began to shine like silver. And long afterward, but those two sang all the time, the east began to turn red, and at last, unclouded, the sun came up out of the sea, and its long level ray shot down the length of the table, on the gold and silver, and on the stone knife. Once or twice before, the Narnians had wondered whether the sun, at its rising, did not look bigger in these seas than it had looked at home. This time they were certain. There was no mistaking it, and the brightness of its ray on the dew, and on the table was far beyond any morning brightness they had ever seen. And as Edmund said afterward, though lots of things happened on that trip, which sound more exciting, that moment was really the most exciting. For now they knew that they had truly come to the beginning of the end of the world. Then something seemed to be flying at them, out of the very centre of the rising sun. But of course, one couldn't look steadily in that direction to make sure. But presently the air became full of voices. Voices which took up the same song that the lady and her father were singing, but in far wilder tones and in a language which no one knew. And soon after that the owners of these voices could be seen. They were birds, large and white, and they came by hundreds and thousands and alighted on everything, on the grass and the pavement, on the table, on your shoulders, your hands and your head, till it looked as if heavy snow had fallen. For, like snow, they not only made everything white, but blurred and blunted all shapes. But Lucy, looking out from between the wings of the birds that covered her, saw one bird fly to the old man with something in its beak that looked like a little fruit unless it was a little live coal, which it might have been, for it was too bright to look at, and the bird laid it in the old man's mouth. Then the birds stopped their singing and appeared to be very busy about the table. When they rose from it again, everything on the table that could be eaten or drunk had disappeared. These birds rose from their meal in their thousands and hundreds, and carried away all the things that could not be eaten or drunk, such as bones, rinds and shells, and took their flight back to the rising sun. But now, because they were not singing, the whir of their wings seemed to set the whole air a-tremble, and there was the table pecked clean and empty, and the three old lords of Narnia still fast asleep. Now at last the old man turned to the travellers and bade them welcome. Sir, 
said Caspian. Will you tell us how to undo the enchantment which holds these three Narnian lords asleep? I will gladly tell you that, my son, said the old man. To break this enchantment, you must sail to the world's end, or as near as you can come to it, and you must come back, having left at least one of your company behind. And what must happen to that one? asked Ripicheep. He must go on into the utter east and never return into the world. That is my heart's desire, said Ripicheep. And are we near the world's end now, sir? asked Caspian. Have you any knowledge of the seas and lands further east than this? I saw them long ago, said the old man, but it was from a great height. I cannot tell you such things as sailors need to know. Do you mean you were flying in the air? Eustace blurted out. I was a long way above the air, my son, replied the old man. I am Ramandu, but I see that you stare at one another and have not heard this name. And no wonder, for the days when I was a star had ceased long before any of you knew this world, and all the constellations have changed. Golly, said Edmund under his breath. He's a retired star. Aren't you a star any longer? asked Lucy. I am a star at rest, my daughter, answered Ramondew. When I set for the last time, decrepit and old beyond all that you can reckon, I was carried to this island. I am not so old now as I was then. Every morning a bird brings me a fireberry from the valleys in the sun, and each fireberry takes away a little of my age. And when I have become as young as the child that was born yesterday, then I shall take my rising again. For we are at earth's eastern rim, and once more tread the great dance. In our world, said Eustace, a star is a huge ball of flaming gas. Even in your world, my son, that is not what a star is, but only what it is made of. And in this world you have already met a star, for I think you have been with Coriakin. Is he a retired star too? said Lucy. Well, not quite the same, said Ramondew. It was not quite as a rest that he was set to govern the Duffers. You might call it a punishment. He might have shone for thousands of years more in the southern winter sky if all had gone well. What did he do, sir? asked Caspian. My son, said Ramondew, it is not for you, a son of Adam, to know what faults a star can commit. But come, we waste time in such talk. Are you yet resolved? Will you sail further east and come again? leaving one to return no more, and so break the enchantment, or will you sail westward? Surely, sire, said Ripicheep, there is no question about that. It is very plainly part of our quest, to rescue these three lords from enchantment. I think the same, Ripicheep, replied Caspian, and even if it were not so, it would break my heart not to go as near the world's end, as the dawn-treader will take us. "'but I am thinking of the crew. "'They signed on to seek the seven lords, "'not to reach the rim of the earth. "'If we sail east from here, "'we sail to find the edge, the utter east, "'and no one knows how far it is. "'They're brave fellows, "'but I see signs that some of them are weary of the voyage "'and long to have our prow pointing to Narnia again. "'I don't think I should take them further.' without their knowledge and consent. And then there's the poor Lord Roop. He's a broken man. My son, said the star, it would be no use, even though you wished it, to sail for the world's end with men unwilling or men deceived. That is not how great unenchantments are achieved. They must know where they go and why. But who is this broken man you speak of? Caspin told Ramandu the story of Roop. I can give him what he needs most, 
said Ramondu. In this island there is sleep without stint or measure, and sleep in which no faintest footfall of a dream was ever heard. Let him sit beside these other three and drink oblivion till your return. Oh, do let's do that, Caspian, said Lucy. I'm sure it's just what he would love. At that moment they were interrupted by the sound of many feet and voices. Drinian and the rest of the ship's company were approaching. They halted in surprise when they saw Remandu and his daughter, and then, because these were obviously great people, every man uncovered his head. Some sailors eyed the empty dishes and flagons on the table with eyes filled with regret. My lord, said the king to Drinian, pray send two men back to the dawn treader with a message to the lord Roop. Tell him that the last of his old shipmates are here asleep, asleep without dreams, and that he can share it. When this had been done, Caspian told the rest to sit down and laid the whole situation before them. When he had finished there was a long silence and some whispering until presently the master bowman got to his feet and said, What some of us have been wanting to ask for a long time, your majesty, is how we're ever to get home when we do turn, whether we turn here or somewhere else. It's been west and northwest winds all the way, barring an occasional calm. And if that doesn't change, I'd like to know what hopes we have of seeing Narnia again. There's not much chance of supplies lasting while we row all that way. That's landsman's talk, said Drinian. There's always a prevailing west wind in these seas all through the late summer. And it always changes after the new year. We'll have plenty of wind for sailing westward, more than we shall like from all accounts. That's true, master, said an old sailor who was a Galmian by birth. You get some ugly weather rolling up from the east in January and February. And by your leave, sire, if I was in command of this ship, what would you eat while you were wintering here? asked Eustace. This table, said Remandu, will be filled with the king's feast every day at sunset. Now you're talking, said several sailors. Your majesties and gentlemen and ladies all said Rhinelf, there's just one thing I want to say. There's not one of us chaps as was pressed on this journey. We're volunteers. And there's some here that are looking very hard at that table and thinking about king's feasts, who were talking very loud about adventures on the day we sailed from Care Paraval, and swearing they wouldn't come home till we'd found the end of the world. And there were some standing on the quay who would have given all they had to come with us. It was thought a finer thing, then, to have a cabin boy's berth on the dawn treader than to wear a knight's belt. I don't know if you get the hang of what I'm saying, but what I mean is that I think chaps who set out like us will look as silly as, as those duffel puds if we come home and say, we got to the beginning of the world's end and hadn't the heart to go further. Some of the sailors cheered at this, but some said that this was all very well. This isn't going to be much fun, whispered Edmund to Caspian. What are we to do if half those fellows hang back? Wait, Caspian whispered back. I've still a card to play. Aren't you going to say anything, Reap? whispered Lucy. No, why should your majesty expect it? answered Rippercheep in a voice that most people heard. My own plans are made. While I can, I sail east in the dawn treader. When she fails me, I paddle east in my coracle. When she sinks, I shall swim east with my four paws. And when I can swim no longer, if I have not reached Aslan's country, or shot over the edge of the world in some vast cataract, I shall sink with my nose to the sunrise, and Pippiseek will be head of the talking mice in Narnia. Hear, hear, said a sailor. I'll say the same, barring the bit about the coracle, which wouldn't bear me, he added in a lower voice. I'm not going to be outdone by a mouse. At this point, Caspian jumped to his feet. Friends, he said, 
I think you have not quite understood our purpose. You talk as if we had come to you with our hat in our hand, begging for shipmates. It isn't like that at all. We and our royal brother and sister and their kinsman and Sir Rippicheep, the good knight, and the Lord Drinian have an errand to the world's edge. It is our pleasure to choose from among such of you as are willing those whom we deem worthy of so high an enterprise. We have not said that any can come for the asking. That is why we shall now command the Lord Drinian and Master Rince to consider carefully what men among you are the hardest in battle, the most skilled seamen, the purest in blood, the most loyal to our person, and the cleanest of life and manners, and to give their names to us in a schedule. He paused and went on in a quicker voice. Aslan's mane, he exclaimed, do you think that the privilege of seeing the last things is to be bought for a song? Why, every man that comes with us shall bequeath the title of Dawn Treader to all his descendants. And when we land at Care Paravel on the homeward voyage, he shall have either gold or land enough to make him rich all his life. Now, scatter over the island, all of you. In half an hour's time, I shall receive the names that Lord Drinian brings me. There was rather a sheepish silence, and then the crew made their bows and moved away, one in this direction and one in that, but mostly in little knots or bunches talking. And now for the Lord Roop, said Caspian, but turning to the head of the table, he saw that Roop was already there. He had arrived, silent and unnoticed, while the discussion was going on, and was seated beside the Lord Argos. The daughter of Remandu stood beside him as if she had just helped him into his chair. Remandu stood behind him and laid both his hands on Roop's grey head. Even in daylight, a faint silver light came from the hands of the star. There was a smile on Roop's haggard face. He held out one of his hands to Lucy and the other to Caspian. For a moment it looked as if he were going to say something. Then his smile brightened as if he were feeling some delicious sensation. A long sigh of contentment came from his lips. His head fell forward and he slept. Poor Roop, said Lucy. I am glad. He must have had terrible times. Don't let's even think of it, said Eustace. Meanwhile, Caspian's speech helped perhaps by some magic of the island, was having just the effect he intended. A good many, who had been anxious enough to get out of the voyage, felt quite differently about being left out of it. And of course, whenever any one sailor announced that he had made up his mind to ask for permission to sail, the ones who hadn't said this felt that they were getting fewer and more uncomfortable so that before the half-hour was nearly over, several people were positively sucking up to Drinian and Rents. At least, that was what they called it at my school. To get a good report. And soon, there were only three left who didn't want to go, and those three were trying very hard to persuade others to stay with them. And very shortly after that, there was only one left and in the end he began to be afraid of being left behind or on his own, and changed his mind. At the end of the half-hour, they all came trooping back to Aslan's table, and stood at one end while Drinian and Rince went and sat down with Caspian, and made their report. And Caspian accepted all the men but that one who had changed his mind at the last moment. His name was Pitt and Cream and he stayed on the island of the star all the time the others were away, looking for the world's end, and he very much wished he had gone with them. He wasn't the sort of man who could enjoy talking to Remandu and Remandu's daughter, nor they to him, and it rained a good deal, and though there was a wonderful feast on the table every night, he didn't very much enjoy it. He said it gave him the creeps, sitting there alone, and in the rain as likely as not, 
with those four lords asleep at the end of the table. And when the others returned, he felt so out of things that he deserted on the voyage home at the Lone Islands and went and lived in Calamen, where he told wonderful stories about his adventures at the end of the world, until at last he came to believe them himself. So you may say, in a sense, that he lived happily ever after, but he could never bear mice. That night they all ate and drank together at the great table between the pillars, where the feast was magically renewed, and next morning the dawn treader set sail once more, just when the great birds had come and gone again. Lady, said Caspian, I hope to speak with you again when I have broken the enchantments. And Romandu's daughter looked at him and smiled.